Hello everyone, my name is Rachel Sterling. Our readings this week discussed how interactions and groups affect us socially. Being that we are all currently practicing social distancing, I think we can all agree that it was nice to be reminded that humans used to be able to interact face to face. So during this time of social isolation, let's reflect on just how much we are influenced by our relationships with others. We will be discussing the following five major points. In order to belong to a group, we must be willing to conform to that said group. Casson defines conformity as the tendency to change our perceptions, opinions, or behaviors in ways that are consistent with group norms. I give a definition of what a group norm is on this slide, but let's discuss how group norms affect how we respond to individuals. As discussed in the Holly article, athletes tended to be harsher when evaluating fellow athletes who had committed some sort of offense when they were in an athletic situation, although they did assign those athletes less harsh punishments. This seems kind of confusing until we think about group norms and conformity. In order to maintain group order, we need to hold our group members to higher standards than those in outgroups. However, they are still a part of our group, so we are less willing to dole out harsh punishments on those that are more like us than we would be to outgroup members as we discussed earlier in the course. Being part of a group is important to us, but we also want to feel like we have a say in our individuals in our groups. That's why, while we often conform just to fit in, we can resist conforming if we feel we are being treated like, as Casson says in the reading, mindless sheep. If we choose to be nonconformists, we must be persistent and unwavering in our defiant actions or beliefs. That's the best way we can get individuals to break from the norms with us and to create a successful um, nonconformist group. So Casson defines compliance as changes in behavior that are elicited by direct requests. However, the requests don't have to be quite so direct. People can be, can be quite easily trapped by the mere wording of a question, as our brains often run on a sort of autopilot, just picking out keywords and assuming what someone is asking, us from us, asking of us from there. If we hear the word because while being asked for a favor, we often just assume that someone has a reason for the request, an answer without even really listening to what the request is. Casson discusses many ways people can elicit compliance from others. I know that you've probably seen at least one if you have ever watched an infomercial on TV. They're famous for the wait there's more, making bad deals or useless products seem appealing. On the show American Pickers, if you've ever seen it, they will often lowball people they make deals with. They will agree to pay a certain price for an item, but then they claim the item is damaged and ask the seller to throw in another item to make the deal become fair, as they say. They are also very good at playing off of people's natural tendency to follow the norm of reciprocity or the need to repay someone for doing something nice for you. So the pickers, if you pay attention, remind the seller over and over that we can take this off your hands. It's just sitting out here rusting. We'll move it ourselves and we can help you get this place cleaned out. You'll have cash in your hand today. They make it feel like they are doing you a favor so you're more willing to let them buy something at a cheaper price. After all, they were nice enough to help you clean out your garage, right? This will backfire on them sometimes, though. They have been asked very angrily on the show, if you've seen, to leave properties if the seller feels that they are being manipulated. People often respond in anger when they can tell someone is trying to manipulate them with these traps and manipulate them into compliance. So we got a little bit of a taste of the power of obedience um, the very first week of our class when we were reading Milgram's famous shock experiment. This comes up again in the readings in Casson, and actually we find out that there were 18 different variations of this test that he performed, not just the standard one that we talk about. So while this experiment, although was ethically debatable, it demonstrated the intense power of authority figures and the importance of perceived personal responsibility. 
In Milgram's experiment, the authority figure was a scientist in a white lab coat. Even though this scientist didn't really have any power over the participants, after all, they could leave at any time with no repercussions, but just the fact that he was wearing a uniform and telling them the steps of the study put him in a position of perceived authority. We often look at things like white lab coats, badges, and uniforms, and they can make us respond with automatic obedience often not bothering to ask questions before we even act upon what we've been asked to do. But what happens after we act? What happens when we obey an order that hurts another person? Do we feel ashamed, guilty? The answer is probably yes and no. Most every participant in Milgram's study um, was expressing worry and shame and kind of just anxiety as they were doing the experiment. But very few right after they completed the study reported that they felt guilty. You can watch the film of the experiment online, it's on YouTube. Most of the participants didn't take responsibility for their actions when they were interviewed right after the, um, the experiment was over. They, were, they began deflecting the blame onto the scientist, saying things like, he forced me to keep going, or why didn't he go over to the door and check on the guy getting shocked? I told him to go check on the guy getting shocked. The truth was they weren't forced to continue the study, and they could have gotten up and checked on the guy themselves. The door was right there, as the one participant pointed out. However, because they were the middlemen, they were able to deflect responsibility. Something important to note, though, is that this is not a pass for people doing bad things. People are responsible for their actions. It is within everyone's capability to defy and rebel. It takes only one person willing to defy to lead a whole army of people that are willing to. Like in the experiment we read this week conducted by Rees, a teen who doesn't normally drink could resist the urge to drink even in the face of peer pressure, as long as they had just a few other friends who didn't drink as well. It didn't matter that the majority outranked the minority, as long as they had a few friends backing them, saying that they also weren't drinking even when the majority of people were telling them to drink, they felt comfortable not giving in to that peer pressure. So we all belong to several groups. Broad ones, like our genders and looks, don't mean as much to our sense of identity, necessarily, as groups that link us based on our shared interests and talents. Kasson defines group roles as a set of expected behaviors for you to perform within a group. While some roles come with titles such as chief, teacher, mom, or dad, other roles remain nameless but are still important to us. When everyone follows these rules, group norms, as we discussed earlier, the group bec becomes more cohesive. When a group is more cohesive, they tend to perform better together. Like when dancers are learning how their partner moves, they improve with each practice session. We've talked quite a bit about the difference between individualistic cultures and collectivist cultures in this class. So group cohesiveness is another difference between these groups. Collectivist cultures would see a cohesive group as having better personal relationships within the group and having little to no arguments within the group. But a more individualistic culture, like a lot of Eastern cultures, I'm sorry, a lot of Western cultures, like America and Europe, would see cohesiveness as being able to argue about topics among themselves, being heard as individuals within the group. So two things happen when you're performing in the presence of others. Your levels of arousal rise and your dominance response takes over. Your dominance response is how you perform typically when no one's around. Therefore, if you are a trained pianist and perform in front of others, chances are that you'll play well in front of others, even if you are nervous. However, if you're a new piano student forced to play in front of an audience, such as in a recital, you might choke under the pressure and perform very poorly or maybe not even be able to perform at all. While we're discussing performance, let's talk about performance within a group. Two heads are better than one, right? Well, according to research, no. When people are in groups, they often begin something called social loafing. The term may be strange, but we have all been in a group project before where there is one or more members who just won't pull their share. In fact, in a test where they had people pull on a rope blindfolded, one group was told that they were pulling by themselves, and the other was told they were pulling with a group. The one who believed he was pulling with a group literally didn't pull his own weight. They pulled with 20% less effort when they thought they were pulling 
with a group versus when they thought they were pulling alone. While it seems like groups are not as productive as individuals, groups can be, still be very powerful and dangerous. When an individual de-individualizes in a group setting, begins to lose their individuality, they may act in ways that they never would normally, perhaps joining in a riot or participating in bullying another person. In the case of bullying another person, maybe you're conflicted as this person who's taking part in the bullying. These people are your good friends after all, and besides, it's not like they were being that mean to the person. Maybe you didn't participate in the bullying yourself, but you let it slide, saying nothing, because you didn't want to argue or lose your friends. You decide that helping the bullied individual is not as important as keeping the peace with your friends. And that is exactly what groupthink is, the concept of groupthink. Cassa defines it as desiring the need for agreement over the need to obtain accurate information and make appropriate decisions. To think on all these concepts even further, I want to pose two questions. The first, Cassin mentions that there's a link between Christianity and individualism. Is In what ways are the two linked? Do you agree that they are linked or do you believe it's linked with more collectivism cultures? Do you think it could be linked to both? And do you think it's maybe linked to individualism because it's more prevalent in cultures that are individualistic? The second question is that we briefly discussed social loafing and how damaging it can be on productivity. After all, you're not pulling your own weight. We know that phones, computers, and tablets can all be distracting and can lead to cyber loafing, which would be personal, non-work use of technology when you are at work. In what ways can we prevent ourselves and fellow workers from participating in cyber loafing? I want to thank you all for listening to this presentation, and I hope that it encouraged you to think about the material discussed this week even further. Like I said before, in this time of social isolation, I think it's important for us to think about all of our interactions with more care. I think experiencing this quarantine at the same time we are discussing the values of groups and how important other people are to us as individuals, we can eventually go back to normal life with a greater appreciation for the human contact we've been studying throughout this entire course. Thank you again, and I hope you all stay safe and healthy.